Today's scripture reading is from Daniel 12, verses 1 to 10. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled. The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times and half a time, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, My Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. May God bless the reading from his holy word. Well, if you can turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. I don't know what happened, but it was a different passage that Christine wrote, uh, read, I should, should say, but uh, that's okay. It, it was a great passage. Um, but this is Daniel chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 10 that I'd like us to focus in on uh, this morning. And it's the last chapter of the book of Daniel. And it's going to be our final message in our series that we've been doing on Daniel. And we really have uh, been mainly talking about Daniel's life. Uh, a lot of people consider Daniel a prophetic book, and it is full of prophecy. Um, and so this chapter has a little bit of prophecy in it, but I've been mainly focusing on Daniel's life. So I thought I'd throw in a little bit of prophecy. And over the years, if you have been at our church for any length of time, you, you know that I really don't spend a lot of time on the ins and outs of prophecy and the different schools and comparing the different views of prophecy. I am kind of what they call a pan 
pan millennialist, it's all going to pan out in the end. Uh, I see I'm a big picture kind of a guy. And I think you you realize that. And if if you like the the nitty gritty and you like studying prophecy, go for it. But I like the big picture. And I uh, Wayne mentioned something last week. He said the previous pastor of this church, Pastor Porter, he used to talk about there's a wonderful aspect of the Bible and Christianity is that it has a happy ending. It's all going to work out in the end. It's all going to come together. And you read the end of the book of Revelation, and it's a happy ending. And so when we look at this passage, there is good news about the end times, and there are, there's bad news. And so in our world today, we have a lot of pessimism, and we live in quite a pessimistic world. But you know, for Christians, we have no excuse not to be optimistic. We have every reason in the world to be optimists in spite of our world being so pessimistic and so dark and so without hope. So the story is told of a dad who had two twins two six-year-old boys this one time, but the problem was that the one son was an extreme optimist and the other son was an extreme pessimist. And after a while, the dad was getting so frustrated and he decided to go to a psychiatrist to get some help. And the psychiatrist told the dad to buy something that would cheer up the pessimist son and make him more positive, and then to buy something for the optimist son that would bring him down a little bit and not make him so high and happy all the time. So the dad went out and he bought a whole bunch of brand new toys for the pessimist to make him more positive. And then he went out and bought a huge pile of manure for the optimist that would hopefully make him a little more negative. So after a while, after both gifts had arrived, the dad went into the pessimist's bedroom to check up on him. And there he was sitting on the floor with all these new toys around him. And he was just bawling his eyes out. And so the dad asked him, what in the world is wrong? Don't you want to play with your new toys? Yes, cried the little pessimist. But if I do, I know I'm going to break them all. Well, the dad kind of threw his hands up and didn't know what to do, so he decided to go and look for his optimist son to see how he was reacting. So he went out to the driveway where the manure pile was, and there was the little optimist jumping up and down in the manure and digging away and throwing it up in the air and having a great old time, and the dad just couldn't believe it. So he asked the optimist why he was so happy, and with a big smile on his face, the little boy said, there just has to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> now that's an old one. We, as believers in Jesus Christ, should be looking for the positive. We should be looking for the hope that we have in him. And the question I want us to ask ourselves this morning is, what's our outlook? on life. What is our outlook on life? Is it pessimistic or is it optimistic? And in many ways we look around our world today and we see so much negativity. And even Christians who claim people who claim to be believers are so negative and pessimistic. And so we're going to look at our passage today and we're we're going to see how in spite of all the bad news of the end of the times, there's going to be something positive. And we're going to just read chapter 12 again. So let's read chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. It says, I guess we're not going to read it again. We're going to read it for the first time. Uh, it says, 
Again, Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, Michael the archangel, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Verse 3, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Verse 7, the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the rivers lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and I heard him swear by him who lives forever saying it will be for a time, times and a half a time when the power of the holy people has been finally broken all these things will be completed. Verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So when we look at the book of Daniel, all 12 chapters here, the first six chapters deal with Daniel's life and his experiences. And that's what we've focused on in this series for the most part. So it focused on Daniel not eating the king's food and then the fiery furnace and the writing on the wall and Daniel in the lion's den. So those are the first six chapters of the book. And then the last six chapters deal with prophecy, very similar to the book of Revelation. And that's where we run into a lot of problems when it comes to prophecy because Revelation and Daniel are what we call apocalyptic literature and it's very symbolic. And so people over the centuries in church history have had all sorts of problems interpreting the symbolism. And so that's why I don't get too hung up on the specifics and on the timing of the Lord's return and all of that. So we want to really, I just have, there we go. Uh, want to look now at what Daniel describes here in chapter 12. Uh, and it's the end of the age. It's what life is going to be like at the end, at the end of time. And so I'd like to first focus in on the negative description first, the bad news or the pessimistic side first. So we're going to look at a few verses here that give us four specific descriptions of what life is going to be like for a world without God, a world that cares less about God, a world without hope, a world of negativity. And do you think we live in a world like that even now? Yes. We live in a post-Christian era now. A world, a secular society that has no place for God. Certainly not in public life. The attitude is still, if you want to be crazy and worship God and follow him, then you can do it on your own time. Don't bring God into public life. That's what secularism is all about. So we're going to take a look here at these four specific descriptions of what life is, going, is like, really, in our world, even today, without God. And it's going to get worse. 
So four signs here of what life will be like as we get closer to the end. So number one, the first description here is that the future is described as a busy time. The end times are a busy time. Look at verse four of our passage. It says, but you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. And then he says, many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Many will go here and there. Talk about a commentary on our modern world. Everybody, a lot of us live like chickens with our heads cut off. We're running all over the place. Everybody's on the move, everybody's busy. And we're not just on the move as far as speed and travel, but we are, but as far as our lifestyles, busy schedules, stressed out. We all seem to be caught up in such a hectic, frantic pace. And often it's at the expense often of knowing God generally. And sadly, a lot of our busyness, our coming and going today is centered on the pursuit of self and status quo and rushing around chasing after the goals and the values and the priorities of the age in which we live. I personally believe that one of the greatest strategies of Satan is keeping us busy and keeping us distracted from the things of God. To keep people from being still before God and especially with new technology where a lot of us are plugged in and we're disconnected to the point where we're too busy and too distracted to think about him, think about God, to contemplate him. I remember when we lived in Alberta, we went to a few Edmonton Oiler games way back then when Gretzky was doing his thing during the golden age of Oiler hockey and it was the first time I went to one of the games uh, and I hadn't been, I guess, for a few years. And I, I noticed that the entire game, throughout the entire game, and you'll know that we've gotten used to it now, but that was my first the first time I noticed, as soon as the whistle blew for the hockey game and the players stopped playing even, immediately pounding rock music would start playing. During, you couldn't just sit there in quiet. Boom, boom, boom. And recently I read an article that talked about a study that's been done with grade one students, six-year-olds, and it shows, this was a few years ago, it shows that most children today don't daydream anymore. That was my favorite pastime as a kid. <laughs> Do you know that? Did, did you know that? They don't daydream because they don't have any free time. They're plugged in, or they're online, or they're playing video games, or they're watching TV, or they're listening to something. They're too busy to take time out to even daydream or contemplate life. Jesus addressed that very issue, I think, in Luke chapter 10, verses 41 to 42. He said to Martha, remember Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus? He said, Mar Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen, your sister has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Meaning, Martha, you're worrying, you're upset, you're busy. You're trying to get done everything that needs to be done, but she was being distracted from what really mattered. Instead of taking time out, instead of making God a priority, spending time, instead of spending time with Jesus, she's busy in the kitchen. And for us, that defines the sign of the times. I believe we're too busy for God. And especially for us as believers, that's how we get discouraged. That's how we get pessimistic. That's how we, we lose hope if we're not being fulfilled and we're not being finding hope in Christ. We need to fight against 
that busyness or being distracted where either life is always hectic or chaotic or on the other hand, we're always distracted watching too much TV or we're plugged in. It's still busy time. It's time where we're distracted from being still before God. So the challenge here is to recognize that, not to be busy all the time, to be aware of that, to ask God for wisdom and strength in this area. And I'm not picking on anybody. I am talking to myself. I'm preaching to myself. It's easily done. We need to specifically ask God for help in this area to purposely and deliberately take time out for Jesus every day. And a lot of times that does not come natural. It's something we have to be proactive about and we, we have to be disciplined about. To choose what is better, to spend time praying to him and reading his word and grow, growing in our relationship with him. That takes discipline sometimes. Here are some great verses. You can look them up or you can just listen. Psalm 46, verse 10. It says, God says, or he says, be still. That's the old familiar passage. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That's, that just means take your eyes off this world. Take your eyes off yourself, of your life, and be still. Look up. Look up and see him. See who he is. See what he's done. Exodus 14, 14 says, The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Psalm 131, 2 says, But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. That's the hope of the Christian. Living in a hectic, busy world, we have a resource. We can find rest for our souls. We can take time out. We can be still and know that God is our source of peace and renewal and refreshing. So that's the first point. The end of the age will be a busy time. And then number two, the second description of the end of the age, the end times here, is that it will be a brilliant time. A busy time, a brilliant time. Look at the end of verse four, just as a little phrase here, it says that the goal of going here and there, being busy, is what? What is the goal? Here it says to increase knowledge. There's no question today that we live in an age of brilliance and an age of knowledge at our fingertips. Christy asked me some theological question and I can, I can go, duh, I, I don't know, but I can just quietly take my phone in, into the kitchen and look up the question and come back and say, oh, sorry, I forgot about that for a minute. Here's the answer. Now, I, I don't think I've done that very much. That was just a spur of the moment illustration. We have knowledge, unbelievable knowledge. When we were, a lot of us were growing up, we had to get a big, thick encyclopedia. Now it's boom. We have instant information. Scientists tell us that we have made more technological advances in the last 50 years than in all of history combined. An increase of knowledge and we see this explosion all around us. There's an increase in scientific knowledge, technical knowledge, medical knowledge, but all of that hasn't helped very much when it comes to our morals and our values and our world becoming a better place and less hopelessness. People are more hopeless now than they've ever been or in terms of peace and safety, or in terms of our emotional or our spiritual quality of life. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament talks about the last days. This is another familiar passage in 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. He says, always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth. And that's what we see. People put their hope in education 
Oh, we just have to be, become as a world, as a culture, as a society, we just have to become more educated and smarter in the things of this world. That falls flat. And what happens when we increase in human knowledge, when we increase in knowledge without God, what happens? Scripture says it turns us away. It makes us proud and self-sufficient and self-confident. In 1 Corinthians, maybe you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. It says knowledge puffs up. And that's talking about worldly knowledge, human wisdom. When we increase in that kind of knowledge, we don't need God anymore. Why? Because we have all the answers. Humankind has all the answers. Science has all the answers. And if you're still in 1 Corinthians, yeah, that wasn't a lot to look for, sorry, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and this is where Paul talks, famous passage where Paul talks about the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of the cross, sounds crazy when we put our confidence in worldly wisdom or in our own wisdom. God's wisdom doesn't make any sense because humanly speaking, we think we can fix our own problems and save ourselves. So that's why we put our trust in, in science or in medicine. We don't need God's wisdom, we've got our own wisdom. And the Apostle Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 1. But he says, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Meaning there's power in God's wisdom. There isn't any power in man's wisdom. And we've seen that throughout history. With God's wisdom, there's power. And then he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise... The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? Meaning the wisdom of this world is always going to get frustrated. It's always going to come up short. Doesn't really have any power to change hearts and lives. Amen? We think of the theory of evolution or the dream of communism or the promise of a utopian society or the promise of world peace or the hope of a heaven on earth or the idea that education will solve all our problems or all we have to do is get smarter and then we'll discover all the answers and even though our world has tried all these things, we're still in a mess. We will never find lasting answers to life's questions. We will never change. We will never find ultimate meaning and purpose and hope and truth in human wisdom. Paul says it's foolishness in the light of God's wisdom. And it's so interesting as you look at history. Every new generation comes along and they think that they, they are the smartest and they're going to get everything done. They're going to find all the answers to, to life. And by the end of that generation, they are all fizzled out and they're still searching. And a new generation comes along and oh, they have all the answers. Always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth. So the end of the age will be a busy time, then it'll be a brilliant time, increasing in knowledge. Then number three, the third description of the end times is that it will be, I had to come up with a really good B, another B, a blatantly bad time. A blatantly bad time. A blatantly wicked time, the end of the age. Look at verse 10. 
it says many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. And in, in our age, the wickedness is all glossed over. It's presented in a very clean and sterile package. So along with an increase in knowledge, there's going to be an increase in wickedness. The two go hand in hand. Human wisdom doesn't make us better. It makes us worse. Many people are saying today that Western culture has gone beyond even the post-Christian era. We are post-post. We are now slipping into a dark age, the dark ages again, especially in terms of morality and decency. Sounds like the girls downstairs are having a good time. <laughs> and our knowledge hasn't amounted to anything. It hasn't changed us on the inside, hasn't done anything as far as our hope or better lives or more fulfilled lives. Without God, our hearts are still sinful and wicked. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one to four, it sums up the wickedness. This is maybe a passage you could turn to in your Bibles. Second Timothy. Towards the end, the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 1. It sums up the wickedness of the end times. The end of the age, it says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Daniel says the wicked will continue to be wicked and it'll get worse. So the last days, so that's the pessimistic side. That's the bad news. It'll be a busy time. It'll be a brilliant time. It'll be a blatantly bad, wicked time. And then number four, the fourth description is that it will be a blind time, a spiritually blind time. Look at the end of verse 10. It says, none of the wicked will understand. So that's talking about spiritual blindness, having no understanding of God. And we see that around us. A lot of churches are a lot emptier than they used to be. Paul says in the New Testament, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those who believe not having no understanding, in spite of all the world's knowledge and all the advances, the world is still spiritually blind. And we see, again, we see that generally with people not having much interest in spiritual things or in God anymore, even so-called professing Christians. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4 says, the God of this age, that's what I quoted, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel. Matthew 24, this is Jesus. Matthew 24, verses four and five, concerning the last days, Jesus says this, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. It's an age of spiritual blindness and an age of deception. Many will come and deceive people. Spiritual blindness and deception go hand in hand. That's a definite sign of the end times. And then 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 4 says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. If that's not descriptive of our society, I don't know what is. That's the kind of world we live in. 
And sometimes even in the modern church, we're deceived and we're blinded to God's truth. And in many churches today, people just want to hear from the preacher what their itching ears want to hear. They only want to hear a feel good kind of gospel. They only want to hear what God's, about God's love and his grace. They want to hear what makes them feel warm and fuzzy and comfortable and happy. They don't want to hear the truth about sin and judgment and hell and God's wrath and the pessimistic side, the bad news. That stuff is too disturbing and too uncomfortable. So the book of Daniel tells us that the end of the age will be a busy time, it'll be a brilliant time, a blatantly bad, wicked time, and then a blind time, a time of spiritual deception, spiritual blindness, no understanding. And of course, that all sounds pretty pessimistic. It all sounds like a pretty bleak picture of the future. And we might ask ourselves, well, is there any hope? Is there any reason to be optimistic? And I have given you some clues ahead of time. Of course there is. For the believer, for those of us who are in Christ, but it's only in Christ. It's only on that rock. For those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there's plenty of hope and plenty of reason to be optimistic, even in this passage. Even here in Daniel chapter 12, there are glimpses of hope and optimism all the way through. And when we think so A, the first point on, on the optimism part, when we think of this age being a busy time, what's the answer? What's the solution to getting distracted and being sucked in to the busyness of the culture? What's the hope? How do we overcome that? How do we cope in that kind of a world? What's the opposite of busyness? Well, we all know. It's not being busy. <laughs> it's rest. It's rest, finding rest for our souls. And yet, yes, sometimes our careers and our lives cause us to be busy, but as believers, there's a place of rest even in the midst of that busyness. Verse two in our passage says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And then if you look down at verse 13, just down from our passage, verse 13, it says, as for you, for us, meaning for you, Daniel, for you believers, go your own way to the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will receive your allotted inheritance. We can rest in the hope of resurrection, in the hope of eternal life, in the hope of spending eternity with Jesus. These verses are talking about eternal rest. It's talking about when we're raptured or when we're resurrected at the end of the age. It's talking about our future hope in Jesus, our hope of heaven and resting in God and finding eternal rest for all eternity. But scripture, of course, also talks about a present rest, an indwelling rest or a continuing rest, even in this life before the end, even in spite of all the distraction and all the busyness of our world. Jesus said, very famous passage, Matthew 28, verse 11 and 12, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's a promise. Claim that promise today. You will find rest for your souls. You can count on it. Jesus is the one who guarantees it. You will. If you come to me, he says, if you lay your burdens down, you'll find rest for your souls. And then Jeremiah in the Old Testament, chapter six, verse 16, it says, stand at the crossroads. 
What are the crossroads in our lives? Choosing the world's way, choosing God's way. Stand at the crossroads. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. I love that. That is such, because we're at crossroads every day in our lives where we choose. That's the answer to coping with a busy world. Seek the Lord. Find out what the good way is and walk in it. Rest in it. Rest in God. That's where we'll find lasting peace and rest for our souls. That's the first point. That's A. And then B. What about living in a brilliant time? How do we stand up? How do we resist putting our hope in human wisdom and in human education and in technology and in this increase of knowledge? The answer is in verse 3 of our passage. It says, those who are wise, meaning wise in God, godly wisdom will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is talking about being wise in the wisdom of God, not human wisdom or human brilliance. When you're wise in God, you'll be truly brilliant. It says you'll even shine. What does that mean? Well, if you're gaining in God's wisdom, God's wisdom changes us. Instead of us being dull and bland, we start to shine. We start to change on the inside. It affects our hearts. It affects our behavior. affects our morality. It's not just head knowledge. Wisdom from God has to do with his plan for our lives and knowing God's will and him changing us and doing a work inside our lives, inside our hearts. That should be our focus, not the accumulating of worldly knowledge. We're to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God, of who he is and what he's done and what he has in store for us and his plan and his promise, his blessings, the riches that we have in Christ. That's where true wisdom is found. Amen? Amen. And then we think about living in a wicked world how do we stand up to that? Where we're, we have to work in it and live in it and deal with it in this blatantly bad time. How do we cope? How do we stand up against that? Well, if you look at the last part of verse one, the last part of verse one, it says, but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. So, and of course, if you go through the Bible, you can find hundreds and hundreds of verses that talk about being delivered or saved or rescued. We will be delivered. That's another promise. That's the hope of living in a wicked world. There is deliverance. There is salvation. And we need to not only preach it, but to encourage each other with it, to come alongside each other with it, to lift each other up and to say, there is hope. There is deliverance. We're on the winning side. We worship God. We worship Jesus, who is a savior of sinners. One writer writes, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a tech person or a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a savior. That's how we cope with sin and wickedness in our world today and in our own lives. We turn to the only one who can save us and deliver us. And we forget about all those other things that we're looking at and searching for. And then when we think of us living in a blind time, how do we overcome spiritual blindness? How do we see the light? The first part of verse 10 says, many will be purified, made spotless, and be refined. 
This is talking again about something God does, an act of God, something supernatural. In the New Testament, 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There is no true wisdom. There is no true understanding. There's no real spiritual insight without God shining his light in our hearts. Without a supernatural intervention, God has to open our eyes without him saving us and purifying us and making us spotless and refined. God has to turn the lights on. I think I've shared this a few times, but our, our good friend Brock, who is in Newfoundland with Adrian, his wife, for the summer, when he came to Christ, that's what he said to, to me. He said they would be in Texas during the winter and in the summer they would come back to Napanee and he would walk past our church many many times and it was like there was nothing there and then he came back to Christ in Texas and he said it was like boom the lights went on he saw our sign he saw a Baptist church I was saved in a Baptist church maybe I need to start going to the Baptist church the lights came on. And I think a lot of us have that testimony. I went for years walking around in the dark, blinded, completely blinded to the things of God. And all of a sudden, God shone his light in my heart. And that's how we deal with spiritual blindness. First of all, we come to Christ and we accept him as our savior and we turn from our wicked ways and we turn from ourselves and we were born again and we let his light shine in our hearts. And then once we're Christians, we start to walk in that light. First John 1, 7, I quote this verse all the time, but if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We have to walk daily, exposing ourselves to the light through prayer, through Bible study, coming back to God. That's a daily thing. That's how we overcome the blindness and the spirit of this age. That's how we beat spiritual blindness, by walking in the light, not walking in the dark. What happens when you walk in the dark? You bump into things. And you get knocked down and you get bruised and battered. It's by walking in the light of God's word and his truth and his promises and in the light of salvation and the light of what Jesus did on the cross for us. Warren Wearsby, the well-known pastor and Bible teacher, he tells the story of when he was a young pastor and he was preaching on the last days, preaching on prophecy and he had all these charts out and he had figured it all out and at the end of the service an old man from the audience came up to him and whispered in his ear he said when i was a young man i was just like you i used to have the lord's return all figured out down to the last detail but when i got older i moved from the planning committee to the welcoming committee and i really like that I've been in many situations where people get all excited and they get all worked up about prophecy and they get, get hung up about it. They love talking about the different views and the different schools of thought. They get all emotional and they argue about the timing of events and how current events relate to the second coming and they like the sensational aspects of prophecy, but they don't worry a whole lot about getting ready themselves and being on the planning committee. We want to be on the welcoming committee. We want to be focused on the hope of his coming. That's what I want to preach about and focus on. That's where all the optimism is, to be looking for that great day forward. And the book of Daniel, like we've said before, it's all about two or three main themes. What's the first one? Can someone tell me? It's about the sovereignty of God. 
God's sovereignty. He is over all things. Everything works out according to his sovereign will. God is sovereign. It's all about his sovereignty and his faithfulness, of course, and it's about Daniel's faithfulness. Daniel was faithful in spite of the pessimism, in spite of what was happening in that pagan world of Babylon. God wants us to be faithful to the end, just like Daniel. In spite of our world, in spite of future events, we need to move from the planning committee to the welcoming committee and to be ready for the any moment return. Do you believe that? I believe Christ can come back any day. And most of us, we need to make sure that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life all of us, to make sure that we're walking in the light, to make sure that we're living faithful, expectant, welcoming lives, and to make sure that we're ready to welcome and receive the coming King. Amen? Amen. Let's just pray together. Father, we pause before you, and we've been considering Serious things here as we have gone through this passage in Daniel. And Lord, I just want to pray for anyone who might be here today or watching uh, on our YouTube channel later on. I pray that anyone who doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, they don't know their sins forgiven, they don't have that hope that we've been talking about. They don't know the wisdom of God. I would pray for that soul. I would pray for that person that even now, right now, today, they would turn to you, that they would make sure that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and they would have that wonderful hope that the blinders would come off their eyes and they would see you they would see Jesus, they would see that light, and they would be able to walk in it. So I just would pray for anyone who doesn't know you and doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that today they would turn from themselves, that they would repent, that they would fall at the feet, at the foot of the cross, the feet of Jesus, and they would give their lives to you, that they would believe that you died for them, Lord. And Lord, we just pray now for those of us who do believe, and yet we struggle. We struggle in this kind of a world. And we oftentimes get beat up by it, and we fall down, and we get bruised and battered. And yet, Lord, we know that you are our resting place. So draw us back. Draw us close. Help us to find you as our rock and our fortress. Because we know that peace and rest and wisdom can be found nowhere else. You have the words of eternal life, and we want to put our confidence and our hope in you alone. So, Lord, I just ask a blessing today for each one. Just bless each marriage, bless each home, bless each individual. As believers today, help us to keep being faithful to the end the way Daniel was, and we will give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen and amen. Lord, we stand here as a desperate people, hungry for the things of you. Come quiet the storms that rage all around us so that we hear the passion that beats through your heart. Spirit, put healing in our hands, put life in our words, and drive a passion for the lost deep in the hearts of your people. Inhabit the praises of us, your children. And Father, send us out with a reckless passion. Deliver us from evil and set a standard of unity to break down walls and to heal your people. Unity is the cry of your church, Lord. Reconcile the children to the fathers and with forgiveness and mercy, rush through the hearts of our land. We cry out our deep need for you, Jesus. Oh God, come in power and bring glory to your name. 